meet up with me. Probably should put this on YouTube. <laughs> I'll, I'll cut in after this. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> I did, what? Okay. Um, I did a lab on the relationship between the force of gravity and the buoyant force of balloons. And at first, when I wanted to do this experiment, I didn't really know, like, what made balloons. Um, have an acceleration upwards. Like I knew it probably had to do something with the fact that helium is lighter than air, but I didn't really know like what caused the force upwards. So I did some research online, and it's the buoyant force. So obviously downwards is the force of gravity, which is mv, and then upwards you have a much bigger buoyant force. And so that's what I learned. So it's kind of like the balloon is in a pool of air and it's trying, it's like a piece of ice. If you put it at the bottom of a tub of water, it's going to try to go upwards. So the balloon was like attempting to get to the top of air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just talked about my purpose. But another part that I wanted to study was the balloon's movement as I added more mass to the balloon to see if it got um, steadier as you add more mass. And that was actually my hypothesis. So I predicted that um, the path of the balloon would be steadier as you add mass, because the force of gravity would be larger. And I predicted that, that the balloon would experience air resistance, because it's kind of like with the coffee filter lab, but opposite. Um, and I also predicted that the equilibrium point would exist um, when it existed between the force of gravity and the buoyant force. There would be a lot of error because of air resistance. Okay, um, this is the equipment I use, and I'll kind of just talk about that when I show you my setup. So one of the biggest parts of my lap, okay, I figured out that my like laptop has a touch screen, so there's a lot of me writing on it with my finger, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, but a big part of the lab was figuring out the volume of the balloon, because the buoyant force, um, the equation for the buoyant force is the density of air times the volume times gravity. And since I went to Schnucks and had the ladies pull them up, I didn't really know like how much they put in it. It would have been nice if I had like a tank that would tell me exactly how much I put in it. But I kind of had to estimate. So I assumed that the balloon was a perfect sphere, which it wasn't. So there is error involved with that. But I measured the circumference of the balloon <coughs> and um, found the radius that way and then used 4 thirds pi r cubed to find the volume. And this is my setup. This is actually a picture of the balloon in equilibrium when I got it there. And I would have liked to show that here, but there's a latex allergy. So um, I made this cradle that's supposed to be massless, but I took the mass of it so, there, so I could include that in the um, force of gravity. And so I took a sandwich bag and I cut it and I stapled it and attached it to the infinity string that was hanging from the balloon. And um, I didn't really like, there's no like mass here that I could use that's small enough that I could add it to the balloon so that like my, the mass that I'm adding is really precise, so I used rice because it's fairly consistent and it doesn't weigh a lot. Um, and then I used a triple beam balance to weigh that at my house. That's a picture of me. There's a lot of videos, but I was making funny faces, so you don't get to see those. <laughs> um, my assistant, Jimmy, helped me. Um, yeah. I held the balloon. This is my living room. This is a really bad picture. But um, I held the balloon so that the bottom of my massless mass hanger was touching the bottom every time. And then I released it, and the video stopped when the balloon hit the ceiling, which was really fun because then the rice would like fly everywhere and hit me. Um, so here's some of my research with the buoyant force. And I figured out that as long as the helium is, as long as helium is lighter than the air outside, the balloon will float in air which is due to the buoyant force, which I talked about. And here's the values for um, the density of helium and air. And air is mostly nitrogen, so that, that value may, um, might, mainly comes from the density of nitrogen. And that came from that website there. Somebody should tell how stuff works that grams is not weight. True. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's my background. And I derived an equation that tells you how much mass you can add to the balloon um, before it stops floating. And so that's basically just the buoyant force minus mg. But I included, you have to include the mass of the balloon's helium and the actual latex balloon. So you have to subtract that from, um, like this is the buoyant force minus mg. 
but I could take out in the G because it's you can factor that. But um, you have to also subtract the mass of the balloon and the helium in order to tell like what actual mass you can add to make it not move upwards. Um, and this is my part two, which is where I um, tracked the movement of the balloon upwards, and this tells me the drag force of like the air resistance. So I had two parts. One, I was just like figuring out the equilibrium point between gravity and um, the buoyant force, and then the other part I was actually um, learning about the air resistance. So that's just the equation for air resistance, and basically once it reaches the terminal velocity, it's in equilibrium. And so the drag force is when the buoyant force is equal to mg plus drag force. So that's how I figured that out, which is in there if you're interested. Um, so I kind of have been talking about my procedure. And here's the actual data I got. So I, did, I had two ways of figuring out the equilibrium point. One way I did was the, using a force sensor. And so I flipped the force sensor upside down so that the hook was facing up like this and attached the balloon. And that gave me the net force. It, it was the tension in the infinity string, which is the net force of mg and the buoyant force. So then if I just divided by, that by gravity, it would tell me how much mass um, I would need to add until it reached equilibrium. So I had a theoretical mass from the force sensor when I did all of my equations. And then I had the actual mass, which applies to both of these right here. Um, which is the mass that I had to add for each of the balloons to get it to not float in air. And I had four different balloons I did, and they all had, they all luckily had a different force because the Schnooks ladies are not physicists. And so that was a nice surprise. And the other way that I figured out how much mass I would add was using the volume. And as you can tell, the theoretical mass is ginormous compared to the actual mass I had to add because the volume is a lot smaller than I actually calculated. Because it's not sphere. Um, so here's my amount <coughs> of error. And as you can tell, the error in the one that I calculated the volume is a lot larger than the force sensor method. The force sensor method was actually really accurate, um, probably because it was being done by computers and not humans. And so that was cool. Um, and then here's my part two. So in part two, that was the video part that I showed. And so I basically just got the drag force. There's two different balloons. So where this arrow starts is where the new balloon occurs. And I found, as you can see, the, the drag force is decreasing as I am adding mass. So as I added mass, there was less air force of like air resistance on the balloon. And this actually ended up making the balloon's path steadier, which I have graphs that show that. So this is the first balloon that no mass was added. And basically what it looked like in the video was like the balloon would go up and then dramatically curve to the side. Um, and so this shows how much it moved in the x direction, and this is how much it moved in the y direction. And so right here is where the, the there was like a terminal velocity, and that's where it started going crazy. And so the path was really inconsistent, and if you were traveling in that balloon, you would probably die. <laughs> Um, so I added more mass, and this was my steadiest one, and this was when I added 5 grams. And as you can see, the x position was basically constant. I did um, like video analysis with this, so I tracked it with the tracker tool. And the y position was also extremely constant, and this would be the terminal velocity. And so then I graphed the percent of the maximum mass because each of the balloon has a different maximum mass you can carry because they had different for, um, different amounts of helium in them. So basically, like for every, based on the density of helium, for every um, like gram that you add, there is a, like a volume of helium that can carry that amount of mass. So I graphed the percent of maximum mass because those two things are um, comparable between whichever balloons you use. And then I graphed that with the terminal velocity. And this is the first balloon which had more helium in it than balloon two. And so the slope was steeper. So I, the terminal velocity decreases by about this much per um, percent of ma maximum mass that you do, which makes sense because 1% um, of the, the maximum mass of this balloon is going to be a lot more than the 1% of this maximum mass because they can hold different amounts of and so, in conclusion, I people actually do this. They actually travel in balloons. So.
so that was where my equations came from. So I calculated um, equations that I could use to figure out how much mass a balloon could carry. And it, it'll give you a volume when you figure it out with the equation I derived. And you can just divide that by the number of balloons you have. If you figure out like the maximum capacity of a balloon, you can divide the volume. You would need of helium by the number of balloons, and it'll tell you how many balloons you need. And um, in the future, I would like to figure out an equation that tells you like how fast the balloons would be, because I just derived equations that tell you like before you're going to start to sink. But I, it would be cool to figure out like what the speed would be if you add this certain percent of mass. But yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Questions for Holly? Questions? Don't hit me. <laughs> yeah. Do you know how many like balloons it would take to lift a human? Oh. I didn't figure that out. I should have because it would have been cool. Yeah. I actually <laughs> wanted to do it, but I'm not rich, and I really wanted to do it, like. That'd be probably balloons. a lot of balloons. Yeah. If I get a grant someday, that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would the balloons still float if it was in a vacuum but still affected by gravity? Um, I think in a in a in a, um, a vacuum it would probably be better because there wouldn't be air resistance. Like that was my biggest problem. Was, like in my house, there's it's like really drafty. So my equilibrium point and all of my air resistance was like a lot because we constantly have like air moving around in my house. So I think I like a vacuum would have been a lot better. Wait, call me first before. Okay, going. here. <laughs> okay. Wouldn't there not be a buoyant force in a vacuum? I, I guess. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't think about vacuums. But yeah. Hello. Well, yeah. I just have one question. Like, wouldn't the helium be much heavier because it's light in comparison to the atmosphere? Yeah. But if there was no atmosphere, then it would be the heaviest thing around. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> I don't know. I guess like the the ideal scenario would just be like. No air conditioning. Yeah. Like a room that nobody's moving around in. Thanks, Holly.